Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh1, and you are watching One Mind Syndicate. Today we continue talking about Space Marine Chapters as we get into the Howling Griffin. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40k lore videos every single day, and if you have any suggestions, please comment down below. But with that said, let's get into 40 facts on the Howling Griffin chapter. The Howling Griffins are a loyalist space marine chapter, founded in the 33rd millennium from the gene seed of the Ultramarines. The Howling Griffins take pride in their oaths, seeing each as a promise to an unending effort until the deed sworn in the oath is accomplished or the Oath Taker has been slain in the trying. The Howling Griffins chapter utilizes a unique color scheme that is a quartered red and yellow design. The Aquila and the Imperialis on the chest guard is silver in color. The Howling Griffins chapter badge is a black griffin rampant centered upon a quartered field of red and yellow. The Howling Griffins are traditionalists amongst their fellow Adeptus Astarte. Their exact origins remain lost in the Shadow Wars of the 33rd millennium. But what is known is that they could always be found to be a highly active chapter. While the tragedy of the Horus Heresy had been ended, there were always countless ongoing threats to the Imperium security at that time. Few Space Marine chapters can boast of such extensive campaign honors as the Howling Griffins. This chapter is notable for having been at the forefront of a great many Imperial battles and campaigns throughout the ages. The Howling Griffins are also justly proud of their ability to engage almost continuously in conflict and successfully fight most bitterly contested campaigns. Due to the Howling Griffin's glorious record, they have gained the right and title from the High Lords of Terra to recruit their initiates from several different worlds in order to sustain a high level of induction and combat the continuous attrition in the chapter's ranks. Since the time of its founding, the chapter has almost consistently been engaged in at least one campaign and often divides its companies so that its battle brothers may be committed to multiple simultaneous engagements. In spite of accepting this challenge, their degree of success and unwavering courage has garnered them tremendous success. Without a high degree of a tremendous amount of devotion to the Imperium, it would be impossible for any chapter to assemble such a role of honors. These successes have come against a broad variety of foes as well. Against the forces of the Immaterium, the Howling Griffins have played key roles in overcoming several Black Crusades brought forth by Abaddon the Despoiler. The entirety of the chapter's forces united on Gunderdark to overcome an orc threat, preserving the efforts of that campaign. The chapter even stopped the Necrotex of Nath to end their small empire during the Plague of Unbelief. However, a dark shadow has fallen over the Howling Griffin's otherwise glorious history. The chapter maintains a long-standing bloody vendetta against the foul entity who would become the demon prince Percy Clitter, the Forsworn, and the word bearer's traitor legion from which this vile creature sprang. For millennia, the Howling Griffins have pursued Percy Clitter's mixed warband of word bearers and night lords chaos space marine, who were responsible for the death of the Howling Griffin's former chapter master, Orlando Furioso and the entire First Company on the 5,000th anniversary of the chapter's creation at the Ariel's Point Massacre. During the 13th Black Crusade, however, the current chapter master, Alvarado, diverted his battle barge Force of Destiny from the war effort to pursue the Demon Prince. Revenge was finally obtained when Percy Clitter was vanished at the height of the Titanic space battle between the Howling Griffin's First Company and the Chaos Space Marines of the Demon Prince's warband. The Howling Griffin's gene seed is consistent genetically with that of the other chapters from the lineage of Robo Gilliman. It is free from any known contamination, reproduces stably, and produces a full range of space marine organ implants. Because they are extremely active within multiple war zones, the Howling Griffins are rigorous about harvesting and securing the progenioid glands from its battle brothers in a timely fashion. Recoveries made in the field are secured upon the nearest chapter vessel in short order and then return to Mancora for storage at the earliest possible opportunity. This sense of obligation is in large part due to the fact that the chapter has a very high rate of turnover amongst its members. These space marines prefer to engage in the thickest portion of any battle and are always at war. Consequently, the chapter does suffer a higher than usual casualty rate, which can only be compensated by a proportionally high rate of recruitment and initiation. Currently, records indicate that the chapter is sufficiently well supplied with gene seed to accommodate even these needs. Since the death of Chapter Master Orlando Furioso at the hands of the Demon Prince, the Howling Griffins 
have fostered and nurtured a deep and utter relenting hatred of the word bearers and a vow to seek retribution against them and their lord, no matter the cost. It is a hatred which simmers in the heart of every Howling Griffin battle brother, but one which can spill over in times of madness and consume them and their every thought. Before battle, additional oaths are added to each battle brother's already extensively long list, some for the accomplishment of the chapter's goals and others far more personal. Once an oath is taken, a Howling Griffin's battle brother goes to extreme lengths to complete it even over the course of decades. Completed or satisfied oaths are a badge of honor, often inscribed on parchments or directly into the Howling Griffin's armor. The chapter's drive to fulfill its members' oath often influences but never dictates their tactical decisions. If a battle brother makes his commanding officer aware of an oath and an opportunity arrives to fulfill it, attempts are made to accomplish this need. However, such considerations are only permitted if the situation does not substantially increase the level of risk for a particular engagement. These space marines value their oaths and their honors, but they are generally not willing to accept necessary casualties to fulfill them. There are, of course, exceptions to this rule, particularly as pertain to the word bearers and the demon prince. The Howling Griffins are organized along the strict guidelines provided by the Codex Astarte. Though the chapter sees this tome not so much as a holy rite, but simply as the finest military treaties ever written. Their tactics are in keeping with those prescribed in the Codex, and only waver in situations where Gilliman's doctrines encourage innovation. Because of the work's comprehensive and pragmatic teachings, this is seldom a problem. Even by adhering to the Codex in the strictest fashion, the Howling Griffin sacrificed little flexibility. They remain more than capable of responding effectively to any known opponent and of adapting quickly to the abilities of a noble point. The Howling Griffins are organized into battle companies with specific roles in keeping with the directives of the Codex Astarte. Cases of inconsistency with tenants are generally only due to the high rates of turnover among the chapter's membership. Because these space marines sustain a high rate of casualties and recruit so aggressively, they are not always capable of fielding enough battle brothers to keep all ten companies filled. At times, the chapter has transferred members between companies so that one can be dispatched for an engagement while another undergoes resupply and retaining. Though members often view an assignment to resupply with disdain, most accept its necessity while simultaneously attempting to transfer to another company before it is deployed on a combat mission. The Howling Griffins chapter is also notably well provided for in both arms and war gear. The chapter's extensive forges on their homeworld of Mancora work tirelessly to keep the Howling Griffin supplied and to make good on battlefield losses as they occur. The capacity of their armories are such that they are not only able to keep pace with the chapter's aggressive nature, but are also able to manufacture and maintain some of the rarest battle machines available to the Adeptus Astarte, such as the Land Raider Prometheus and the advanced Mark VIII Arata Pattern Power Armor. Also of note is the chapter's tradition of maintaining powerful psychers in its rank, due in no small part to the recruits they adopt from their homeworld of Mancora, whose population possesses an unusually high frequency of psyker mutations. The recruitment world of Mancora has a higher than average incident of psychers born amongst its population. This has resulted in the chapter's ability to maintain a strong library down through the centuries, due in no small part to their own co-desires, taking on active roles in culling and policing Manacor's population and weeding out those psychers who would be a danger to themselves and the population at large. This fact is reflected by the number and raw talent of the Howling Griffin's librarians. Ultimately, these unique talented space marines exercise their gifts in a manner that is consistent with the teachings of the Codex. However, because the chapter has an exceptionally high number of these psychers, their service plays a critical role in shaping the chapter's engagements. These battle brothers represent a critical strategic asset as the chapter's officers take care to utilize them in the most effective way possible. Most chapters train and test chosen psychers following the ancient ways laid out in the Codex Astarte. Librarians of the Howling Griffins are trained in this way, and with a few minor traditional variances, have been taught to live by the word of the Codex. Howling Griffin's librarians 
have a number of unique psychic abilities only used by the psychers of their chapter. Librarians of the Howling Griffins chapter take their oaths as seriously as any of their brothers and can bind them psychically with blood to make them more potent and enduring. The librarians call upon this eldritch powers when taking on oaths at the start of a mission, committing not just his word but his spirit to the binding and seeding it with a few drops of his own blood. Any other members of the Howling Griffin Squad may choose to participate in the oath taking with the librarian, which will psychically compel them to carry out its terms. This power is known as the Blood Oath. The Griffin's Howl is when a librarian calls to the warp and draws forth a mighty cry like a diving bird of prey to strike fear in his foe and shatter their resolve. This cry is also a potent weapon against warp spawn and can shake the ties which bind them to the material plane sending them screaming back into the immaterial. The last known specialist power is called Perliclitor's Bane. The Howling Griffin's intense hatred of word bearers and their demon prince have been translated by the chapter's librarians into a number of abilities targeted at the Chaos Marines of the Traitor Legions. When the librarian summons up his power, he is creating a psychic resonation that can cause agonizing pain to the members of one of the Traitor Legions present on the battlefield badly eroding their effectiveness in combat. The feudal world of Manicor serves as the homeworld of the Howling Griffins chapter and has done so for all of their known history. The history of its days prior to the chapter's arrival is uncertain, those records long lost to time. Located within the Ultima Segmentum, Imperial records clearly indicate that the chapter had deliberately and artificially prevented the world from advancing beyond a pre-industrial technological base. Through an uncharacteristic degree of covert operations and manipulations, the Howling Griffins have also kept the world's feudal city-states on a near-constant war footing, which has led to the culture that has a poor record of its own origins. This enables the Howling Griffins to select from a pure gene stock of hardened warriors who display the desired traits of ferociousness, stoicism, and tenacity. From the earliest days of their pre-recruitment, the warrior elite of Manicor who will one day become battle brothers of the Howling Griffins, are brought up in a war-torn feudal world of pre-industry. In this crucible of battle, personal and familial honor, and martial duty, the citizens are forged into perfect initiates for the chapter. It is in this life that they learn the value of glorious warfare and to respect and rely on their brothers in arms. While they may lack the technology even to comprehend the military might of the Adeptus Astarte, the people of Manicor are predisposed by the culture of their birth to hold dear the martial ideals held by the Howling Griffins. When the day finally comes that a new recruit is elevated into the ranks of an Adeptus Astarte, it is also as a continuation of its previous life, albeit a much greater scale. His heraldry is no longer that of his local household, it is instead the Griffin Rampant, his allies on the field are no longer the members of his local nobility, they are his battle brothers, and the land he fights to defend is no longer his city-state, it is the entire Imperium of Man. When he first dons the Crimson Livery, he sets aside the military training and traditions of his past life and takes as paramount the teachings of Gilliman as inscribed in the words of the Codex Astarte. The Howling Griffin's Fortress Monastery, known as Proud Eyrie, oversees a substantial number of well-equipped manufactura, which are kept isolated from the world's native inhabitants. These manufactura are productive and capably equipped. The Howling Griffins chapter is capable of manufacturing some less common STC patterns. These include the patterns necessary for Mark VIII Arata Power Armor, as well as the Land Raider Prometheus. Such a highly functional forge and unrestricted access to its output has played a crucial role in the chapter's ability to remain deployed at all times. This vital asset permits the chapter to continuously resupply its fleets and to have sufficient reserves that its initiates can undergo through training prior to entering the field. In addition to Manicor, the Howling Griffins recruit from several other worlds, including Denar IV. This is a necessity for the chapter, as without additional worlds, it would be impossible for them to rapidly recover the heavy losses they suffered by engaging in endless campaigns. It is important to note that in spite of this option, they still continue to preferably recruit for Manicor. Its volatile culture ensures that candidates from the world are more capable of fulfilling the chapter's needs. 
Some of the other recruiting options for the chapter, such as Then R4, have cultures that are less focused on developing candidates who will prove to be worthy and capable initiates. An additional reason for the chapter's aggressive Manicorian recruitment efforts is that the planet has a history of producing a significantly higher number of psychers than would normally be expected. Many of the individuals with these talents are recruited into the Howling Griffins as aspirants. However, the chapter's librarians also oversee the planet's population for undue signs of psychic ability. The codicires weed out any who might possess a risk for the warp contamination or demonic possession. For much of their history, the Howling Griffins have regarded the traitorous Wordbearer Legions as their greatest enemy. The precise origin of their specific conflict with these heretics is unclear. Throughout the chapter's early history, there were countless incidents of assault against the traitor legions. Both forces suffered grievous losses in these battles, as the full fury of these Astartes were unleashed in these savage wars. It was the massacre at Ariel's Point in the 220th year of the 38th millennium that finally pushed the Howling Griffins far beyond the tipping point in their lust for vengeance against the word bearers. The chapter master at that time was Orlando Furioso. He was traveling aboard one of the chapter's battle barges, along with the 8th Company and much of the veteran 1st Company. They were en route to the chapter's homeworld of Manacor to celebrate the 5,000th anniversary of the chapter's founding, when the battle barge stopped in the Ariel's Point system to resupply. The Chaos Lord, Percy Clitter, the Force Worn, led a combined force of Word Bearers and Night Lord's Chaos Space Marines in an ambush against the Loyalists. The Howling Griffins were caught tragically unprepared for battle against so overwhelming an enemy force. In short order, their ancient vessel was destroyed after a brutal boarding action. The surviving space marines made planetfall aboard their Thunderhawks on the surface of the nearby world of Ariel's Quintus. The barren world offered little protection for the outnumbered members of the Howling Griffins. In short order, those who survived the destruction of their battle barge were overwhelmed by the coordinated assault of the traitorous legionnaires. None were left alive, and the chaotic forces seized much of the chapter's war gear, including precious and vitally irreplaceable gear that had been the province of the first company and the chapter master's honor guard. The bodies of those slain were desecrated and their gene seed either destroyed or stolen. The only body recovered by the chapter was the chapter master Furioso. The traitors mounted it upon the Thunderhawk and left it in orbit of Arios Quintus, as a sign to any who might see it. Months later, other members of the Howling Griffins tracked down the missing starship and company, and recovered the chapter master's body and gene seed. After this tragedy, all members of the Howling Griffins chapter swore an oath of vengeance against the word bearers and Perticlitter, who eventually ascended to become a demon prince. The Denar Force Oppression was an imperial military campaign carried out by the Howling Griffins against the Chaos Cultists on an agri world of Denar IV in the year 109 of the 40th millennium. During the long search for the Word Bearers Chaos Space Marine Warband of Declamus the Vaulted, the Howling Griffins Third Company under Captain Penvalth Cochim responded to a planetary distress call from the world of Denar IV. The important supply world had succumbed to rot from within as the worship of the ruinous powers took root amid its flesser cults and cult clans. As the Howling Griffins descended on the planet, they found only a handful of its city-states holding out against the hordes of chaos cultists and demon-possessed madmen. Vastly outnumbered, the Howling Griffins deployed to the savannah and wielding their superiority in armor and air power to stay mobile and spearhead assaults against the heretics smash the cult forces in great sight, sweeping before driving onward to relieving the city sieges. The loyalist inhabitants of Denar greeted the Howling Griffins as divinely sent saviors and gladly rallied to aid them in liberating their world from the dark forces that assailed it, selling their lives alongside the space marines. The remaining campaign was bloody and ruthless, ever after casting a nightmarish pall over the memory of Denimar's people. Since the victory, the Howling Griffins have maintained a lasting oath to protect the planet and the memory of the many martyrs that had their loyalty to the Emperor, while the people of Denar IV have kept faith with their saviors in providing them with vital and the pickings of their youth as the chapter's recruits. The Joe Run Retaliation was an imperial military campaign prosecuted by the Howling Griffins against the treachery of General Joe Run of the 15th 
Helicrylon Ironclad Imperial Guard Battle Group. The entire Imperial Battle Group should have been on its way to reinforce the lines of the Gothic War, but instead turned traitor in the year 109 of the 41st millennium and slaughtered their commissars. The Imperium moved to act with decisive force as the foul taint of the Xenos, known as the Dark Eldar, was found to be the root cause of this betrayal, with Joran and his personal cadre laid low and corrupted by the addictions to the alien's foul psychotropics and depraved practices, thanks to the dark arts of the Cabal of the Crimson Libation. The humans were no more than disposable tools used by the Dark Eldar to enslave planetary populations by treachery and brute force, with little risk to the aliens themselves. This could not remain unpunished, and the retaliation force that the Imperium launched in the year 143 of the 41st millennium was fully intended to smash the rebels and their dark allies with brutal and overwhelming power, annihilating them without regard or mercy. The combined task force was comprised of the Howling Griffins chapter, then about eight companies in effective strength, who were given overall command of the campaign and reinforced with supporting companies from the Ultramarines and the Sons of Auror chapter. The Traitor Guard were intercepted as they made planetfall on the feral world of Asturia. Caught unprepared for such a ferocious counter-assault, over 5,000 renegade guardsmen died in the first hour of the ferocious Space Marine attack torn apart on their landing zones with much of their heavy armor yet to be unlimbered. As the battle was joined in full, the task of destroying the traitor's command fell to the chaplain Armin Titus of the Howling Griffin's 4th Battle Company, who executed a drop pot assault into the heart of the disoriented enemy, confronting not only the elite of General Joe Run's Ogryn Cadre, but also the inhumanely lithe and cruel forms of the Dark Eldar that rose around him. The Howling Griffins dispatched them with bolter fire and unshatterable resolve. It was Titus who fought his way to the Traitor General and delivered the Emperor's judgment despite suffering grievous wounds tainted with vile Dark Eldar poison, cleaving Joran's skull in half with his Crozius Arcanum. He would later be enshrined with all due reverence within a Dreadnought sarcophagus in order to continue his service to his chapter. The traitor's morale collapsed with the death of their leader and the swift deceration of their foul Xenos allies. The disordered and panicked traitors were ruthlessly hunted down and slain in the aftermath. The renegade forces were utterly wiped out within only six hours of the battle's opening salvos. And those were 40 facts on the Howling Griffins. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to thank our patrons on Patreon. It's because of them that we can do this. Link in the description if you guys want to support us. It's a dollar a month. If you didn't enjoy this video, hit the dislike button and comment down in the comment section below. Um, <laughs> I hope you guys are enjoying these uh, compilation videos. Uh, we are working on some pretty cool Horrible Realities videos. So that's going to be coming very, very soon. Um, as well as some other stuff. So stay tuned, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. This is Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate signing out.